Hello, listeners. Welcome to another episode of The Circuit. I am Ben Beharin. Hello, world. I am Jay Goldberg, coming to you from Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix, Arizona. Arizona. Pahonix, mm. as I like to uh, as I like to call it. Um, not not too far from Tucson. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, my phonics uh, is is great. So we recorded last week, and then before a certain kind of momentous semiconductor industry. I don't even want to, what do you want to call it? Uh, event a news drop happened where Intel held a webinar disclosing more details of the foundry business, something that we have covered quite a bit in this topic. We have made attempts to project revenue on our own uh, outside of this. And so this was, this was kind of a, a moment we were, all, we were all looking forward to. And uh, some interesting things came out from that. Um, the first one, which I think was interesting, was a, it was a lot uglier than people thought. I heard so much feedback from like, "Why they're losing? They're losing how much money?" But but within all of that, which I think we we kind of assumed, right? You're going to go to four nodes or five nodes in four years. They're going to spend a ton of capex. You got one customer at up and down of wafer scale based on cyclical shipments. Um, but it was it was ugly. It was uglier than, than most people thought. We we can talk about that. But there was some clear upside, some some positive tone. I mean, it was kind of one of those things like you watch the webinar and, and they're like, oh wait, you know, it gets worse on the next slide. But <laughs> then at the same time, had a super positive tone because it's going to get better. We know how to structurally make this better. Yada yada yada. Anyway, let's 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 start there. Um, what were some of your top top takeaways from the financial breakout for IFS? So I came away hoping for something, and my hope is that they thought really long and hard about the sort of the long-term multi-year game that they have to play now, which is like the, the, the really frustrating part about this, I think, for most investors was their break-even is like 2027, and it's not really profitable until 2030. Right. And... And you think about it, most investors who are listening to that call will have completely different jobs by that time. Like they just, it's like so far beyond the average investor's career time horizon. It's, it's hard for anyone to get excited about it. But my hope is that what they, what they were doing is building in a whole lot of sandbagging into these numbers. Like this is like, this is, I, I got the sense they were kitchen sinking and this is as bad as it can get. And, and now every incremental news point that they're gonna have going forward will be, oh, they're gaining momentum. And I don't know that they did that, um, but uh, just give them the benefit of that and say, yeah, sure, that's what they're doing. So I, I, I tend to agree with you. I think some of the hard things for me to kind of predict outside of that was, um, one, it, it sounded like their wafer costs were were really high and that insight comes at a little bit of a uh, counter to where I thought management was sort of guiding competitiveness and wafers, which they can still do. I mean, they can still make these decisions. I guess I was just a little bit surprised that Intel, I mean, I know they don't factor this in the same way because this is a new exercise, but I was a little bit surprised that like Intel product group is securing wafers at a abnormally high cost what goes into that i don't know but but that that part was a little bit a little bit fuzzy because i did think <clears throat> way for competitiveness was um was a part so i was just a little bit surprised that <clears throat> their costs were that high um you know and obviously their margins were hard to predict everybody was kind of walking away going all right well what were its gross margins and i saw i saw estimates from all the way from negative nine to like negative 20 obviously not good but you want to know right what are the structural elements of this that bring that bring some of these uh these metrics back into and then the other one i didn't fully appreciate because i guess we just didn't fully know is i didn't realize how much for the, the next 24 the next 12 to 18 months worth of products intel product group has left intel foundry because they kept talking about oh and when product group comes back, 
And it wasn't like come back in a little way. It's like, you know, they haven't theoretically secured Intel product group as a customer for 18A yet. I'm assuming they will, but commentary was like, Intel product group will come back in some, will win them back in some capacity and that will help our wafer scale. So I didn't realize so much had left Foundry to date. That was a little surprising. So I, I have a slightly different take on both of those. And I think I'll go backwards order. What, three, four months ago, we did this exercise. We built a model looking at what we thought their financials would look like for, for Intel Foundry. And I, given that we were sort of making stuff up and guessing, we were pretty close, right? We were pretty close. The one, the two things that we, we were furthest off on was gross margins. And we even said when we yeah. published that note is that gross margins are impossible to guess from an outsider because a lot of it is subjective right. Right. up to the company to decide. And they're, they're much worse than we thought. Okay. The other thing is I got a sense, I, I, I got a sense that the, our, our model was about a year behind the actual situation. Right. So, which, which uh, Im implies that we're going to bottom out next, next year. I, I thought it wouldn't bottom out yeah. until 26. So I think it's going to bottom out next year in terms of revenue going back and forth from TSMC. So I, I have a slightly more positive spin on that. I think it's actually, <clears throat> we're, we're almost through the worst of it. It's the end is closer than I would have right. thought. Well, and, and I think they highlighted that saying, you know, this year is going to be the worst of it, which I get. I think just again, I had, I had assumed, hence when we were going through this model in terms of, of wafer costs and Intel shipments, I had just assumed Intel was more of a customer today than is really the case. And so I wasn't – I'm, I'm sure they'll come back. I mean, look, the reality is 18A is going to be, going to be super competitive. There are a lot of efficiencies. Well, and I also say Intel – Intel has always been a Intel product has always been a customer of Intel packaging, not just not wafers. Um, but I, I would I would in full confidence believe they they come back and and that alone will change IFS economics. And so I think you're right. They may be also sandbagging how much of Intel product group comes back because if more comes back than they're modeling, some of these timelines speed up not drastically, but they speed up slightly. Yeah. The, the other thing is in terms of wafer costs, I, I actually think there was a lot of, they, they had a lot going on during this, this webinar. And I, th I think the message, some of their messages got a little bit muddled. So I actually think their wafer costs are very competitive. I don't think they're high. I think what they're talking about, I, I think there's a lot of confusion around, Pat was asked a specific question about gross margins this year versus next year. Yeah. And the, and the yeah. problem is 18A is, ramp, is ramping right now. And as everybody knows, if you've been in the business, is when you ramp a new process, it's expensive. It's just, you, you, there's a lot of, you know, there's, there's debugging, a lot of you, really bad yields. But that's normal. That's normal for any process. And Intel is still pretty good at working through that. And so I actually think that their underlying wafer cost structure is going to be really competitive. Um, I mean, that's good. And I, <clears throat> yeah, I, 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 so I think that's going to be, that's going to be an interesting story a couple of years from now when customers start ramping so, on that. So, so, so the one thing we, we've talked about, and I guess now that we've seen a couple of things happen this year around their Foundry event and now the breaking out of financials, um, what, I, you've looked at this more deeply than I, I have. So... One of their goals was to model product group as if it was a fabulous company. And I saw some commentary come out from that saying like their margins. So look at, look at consumer product group, look at data center. Uh, were kind of better than people thought if you were just analyzing them like you would AMD um, or Qualcomm. So just go, go into that a little bit because I, why, why was that surprising to people? I guess I, I didn't quite get, get why people should have been shocked by that. Yeah, I think this goes to this, this question of gross margins that I touched on a second ago, which is uh, 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 there's a lot of things that are in this process that the company has to decide like who to allocate costs to. And yes, there are, there are some accounting rules here, but there, there's a lot of leeway. There's a, but it, ultimately, mm -hmm. a lot of it is left to judgment, right? You know, the, 
you just think about all, all the steps involved. There's lots of things where you go, well, is it the product side who's asking for, you know, more wafers or is it because the yields are bad or should, should the, the fab side, the, op, the foundry side bear that cost because the, the, the yields are bad. And right. Right. I, I, I don't know. I haven't talked to the finance team about how they made these decisions yet. I, I suspect that they, they just felt like this is the best way to do it. Um, it, but it has the added benefit of now, every time we look at foundry, it should just be steadily improving. It should be, the margin should be just, like I said, they're, they're bottoming out here. So that's, that's right. why I kind of suspect they, they sandbagged it a little bit, which is, which is the right way to do it because everyone is very skeptical about the operation side and how foundry can, can get there. It's a long haul. So like pace, it's good that they're pacing themselves. It's going to be a marathon, right? 2027 break even is a long way to go. So Right, and if if they actually get to break even in twenty twenty six, is that that's going to be a huge victory, right? Like that, and they've set themselves up now to settle sure. that way. Or conversely, conversely, if everything goes wrong, something goes wrong, because things go wrong, they they won't miss that target. So yeah, okay, yeah, all right. I guess that 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 makes sense, especially when when as you point out, this is a judgment call on who bears the cost of inefficiencies, which leads me to one of my more interesting points that we kind of had a back and forth on on Twitter. So I want to discuss this. But so first off, why? Okay, let me just step back. So so they said something on the webinar that I thought was interesting. One that was now that both companies need to adhere to a more strict P&L, they were starting to make decisions on wafer buyouts to beginning testing material that apparently was more efficient than they did before. So like product group might just r order too much testing material and not go through all of it because who cared? They weren't really having to look at how much they were buying because they weren't actually buying it. They were just getting it from, from Foundry. So they, they tried to make it sound like now that the numbers are clear, you're seeing product group and, and Foundry group start to make more uh, responsible and be held accountable for some of these financial metrics. So I think that's a great point. Great. So the question I had is why, why would you have not have done this exercise a while ago? Like, and then you, you made the comment, which, which I want you to dig into, which was the model didn't, the model changed what worked for them before doesn't now, which, which I understand, but I still think a clear picture of these two businesses independently would have been fairly helpful, even if, they weren't going to disclose it. Do you know what I mean? Just, just to be more uh, accountable to your decisions at whatever part of the process that you're making product. So I think that Intel of old had three sort of three forces working for it. One was they relied really heavily on process advantage being the best manufacturer out there. Right. They lean really heavily then mm -hmm. on the sales for mm -hmm. their entire history. Right. They now have to, you know, they can't do that anymore. Uh, two, they, they use the IDM model, the integrated model, fab and fabless, you know, as one mm -hmm. to their advantage in the marketplace. And then the third one is they had a lot of bad habits. Like they just got sloppy because they were, they were the king for so long. And how do I put this politely? They may have made some executive level mistakes, a, a lot of them over the years. Sure. So I, I sure. totally agree that that having a clear reporting structure now is going to go a really long way to fixing all those bad habits. And that's really important. Where I was sort of pushing back with you on Twitter was the fact that th the integrated model gave them a big advantage in the marketplace for years, right? Because the if, if you were in a competitive situation, AMD versus Intel, or you know somebody else say in the, trying to get in the data center. Intel's sales team could always get rush orders to customers. They could just call the fabs and say, "Hey, we need, we need you know, a couple a couple dozen wafers," and the operations guys would drop everything, switch over to that, do that hot lot, get it to the cust get it to the product team so that they could close the close the sale. And again, some of that is just bad habits. Like that, because it really wrecks the fabs financial model. 
but they used it to their mm-hmm. advantage. They would win. They would win deals that way, right? If, I see. You know, if if I like a- Amazon is bidding, bidding like, hey, who's going to get me silicon first? I want to test out your system. The fact that Intel could say, all right, we'll get you. You know, in six weeks, we'll have a, a working system for you, is a huge advantage. Versus AMD, who has to like pay for that actually at TSMC, it's incredibly expensive, it's prohibitively expensive. Gotcha. And so my my okay. question sort so, of to the company, my question to the company now is sort of. How, how is the sales team going to readjust right. to this new adjust to this new world? Right, which which was the point I was going to make, which is that at well, <clears throat> to the degree that AMD had or didn't have scale leverage prior that they do now, I think the answer is maybe you agree that I think maybe maybe Intel would also agree is that you're really going to have to compete solely on merit now a product's merit in terms of its product quality. And I do think this is why 18A comes into picture because, you know, if, if everything on paper that we hear sounds good, this should be an extremely competitive product thanks to, you know, ribbon fet, AKA nano, she- nano sheets and backside power, um, uh, power via, which is, you know, really gate all around, but their version those are structural technology advantages they have that somebody doesn't. And if that yields a product advantage, and I think you made this point a while ago when we were talking about IFS, that when they get a product advantage back, meaning that they have superior product, thus do good sales, and now that we've seen their margins, that's a positive upswing entirely if all those things go according to plan. And so again, it's 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 got to compete on on merit. But in this case, it's both process and the product have to both compete on merit. Yeah, that's right. And I, I think I think we can we can all agree that in, Intel has caught up with TSMC. We're going to know in the next year ish if you know who who's who really is better. However, we're yeah. going to find that and uh, yeah, tough tough to call. I, I'd say I'm a little bit more optimistic about Intel than I was a few weeks ago. Um, but the process side is is the, is is Intel's clearly competitive. The, the next step is yeah. is the prop the product side, and I think that's that's the next thing they're going right. to start to realize is that their their products are how competitive are their products, uh, and that's yep. you know agreed. And I'm 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 excited for that because I do think well. So there's there's two parts, right? And I and I and I want people to to grasp this because. What's coming down the pipe in the next 12 months is largely been made at TSMC. What is after this that's coming, assuming coming back to 18A, I'm actually super interested to see because you, you've never really had an Intel product architecture run on an external foundry. So to A, go through a benchmark that says, hey, this is interesting. It's running on somebody else's process, process technology. Is it still really good or is it maybe even actually really bad, a lot better? And so, and then you're going to have conceivably back-to-back against a product performance upgrade to 18A. It's going to be weird, exciting, but I don't, that's going to be a really interesting comp between the two that they're going to kind of switch foundries and see how much performance 18A gives over um, you know, TSMC3 and, and some others. So that'll be... That'll be very, very interesting, actually. Um, so, yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's act. fun for us as analysts. Go ahead. It's fun for, as fun for us as analysts to watch that because it's an interesting case study. Like we really get to see true comp, a true comparison here. Um, it, it, and it's it's possible to start to construct a, a more bullish case for Intel around that because if they can really have some yeah. compelling process technology. Then they're then they're back in the game, and and that's pretty interesting. Even if IFS and right. it's or I, IF and is long term, lots of question marks. But I and I'm I'm not totally convinced, but I think that's that's sort of how you start to get more optimistic about them. Yeah. Right. Right. I agree. I agree. That's the structural sum of all the parts for the for the bull case, including what their way for scale can look like. Um, in terms of wafer capacity, handle handle some some wafer scale customers that come into it. And again, if they've justified that their process is competitive and or in some ways better than TSMC, 
I, I do think they'll be very attractive to one or two wafer scale customers at TSMC who aren't who aren't priorities. So um, anyway, a couple years off, but some interesting stuff back back and forth. So so some other news has dropped since uh, I don't think we really covered Chips Act for Intel and then Chips Act for uh, TSMC now. The the newest news dropping today about TSMC getting just over six billion in subsidies for their Arizona foundries. They previously were not committing to the leading edge or the bleeding edge um, at Arizona. They are now, although I say with the caveat, by the time these foundries are done, even though they're two nanometer, two nanometer won't, won't be the bleeding edge. It will still be in the mix for leading edge, call it maybe one, N minus one, maybe N minus two. But point being, before they were bringing like N minus five, you know, to at their four nanometer fabs were coming, which is old news by the time we're at one nanometer. So at least it sounds like two two nanometer foundries uh, or uh, fabs, which is very, very positive. And, you know, kind of back into this whole grand scheme, obviously they're bringing a bunch of subsidies to Intel, as including um, uh, tax advantages and loans, which is a lot of opened up capital for Intel, which is nice. Um, and then, uh, and then a big, big part of that being this goal of the United States to now produce roughly 20% of the world's leading edge semiconductors on, uh, on us soil. So that was the chips act news. I don't know if you have any other takes on both what's coming from chips to, to Intel and to, uh, well, was Samsung also, we didn't mention that, but all three of these foundries getting aid from the government. Yeah, I, um, it's another, it's another interesting case study for analysts to watch, like can America do industrial policy? It is very, uh, I have mixed feelings about it, but it's, you know, if we're going to do it, it's good that the money's going to start coming in sooner, uh, get things moving quickly. It is, it is really interesting to hear the, the, the change in tone coming out of TSMC where, you know, for, for months now they've been right. complaining about labor unions and regulation and American workers. And now, oh, no, we're on track. Like, it, it's, a, you know, it's amazing what $7 billion can do to improve your outlook. Yes, yes, true. And, and, and also they had been griping about not being able to find skilled labor. I get it, right? Yes. You've also got to have people to come in and work these factories. Totally understand. But at least, you know, foot foot to the ground, pedal to the metal. It seems like there's some, there's some progress there. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think the chips money is done. I think they're probably going to need a second round for everybody also. So we'll see how long, how long that takes. But Positive well, so, so the, the, in, in the, the I think the grant. The, so I was gonna say I think the the grants are done. Like just like here's some money. The next the next portion will be the tax credits, which are much much bigger than the grants. Mm. And and those those are still in the works. Th those are gonna be a lot more money. They will probably be much less politicized. They'll be fly under the radar. Everyone's. So I, I don't know if we'll actually mm. need more chip more grants, I think that the tax credits are going to go a long way. Yeah, agreed. Um, okay. And then sort of high, high level, you're at uh, an Intel event that's mostly NDA, but has some, some uh, public content in terms of keynote. Um, there's been some, some, some news around Gaudi 3, their kind of new training ish architecture um what's what's so from what you saw so far that's public what what's been interesting yeah i'm at the intel vision event and i would say what's you know like I, i'm the product announcements kind of fly over my head like there's a lot of noise outside sorry about that but the, the product announcement stuff, it's going to come out. I, I, it is what it is. Um, I, w I would say I have come away from this event pretty much unchanged on my view on Intel. 
right? They have all these challenges. They're making progress in some areas. Others can't tell. I will say though that I've come away much more like it's not even not, not so it's not a new thing. It's like I'm just reminded that you know Pat Gelsinger has done a really good job, right? I, we we tend to discount that because Intel's problems are so big and they remain like you know there's some real big challenges still ahead of them, but he's he's taken them a huge way, and I, I think uh, and I mean the the tragedy of all this is we won't see the success of all this until probably he's no longer CEO. Like unless he is in office for another 10 years, which make him the longest running Intel CEO, I think. Like right. he's, you know, he's, he's, he's not going to, he's, not, he's, so I, I think I, I, I want to give him credit now because he may not get it when we actually know, know all the answers. Um, it's, it's a pretty, right. uh, pretty big change, pretty big turnarounds. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I think that, I mean, just in terms of both execution, public kind of commentary and sentiment, I mean, I still think there's a lot of people who assume this is just the intel of old and they they maintain a, a negative paradigm through being burned from some of the last decade's worth of uh, of management decisions and, and, and technology issues. But I think there's definitely a positive change. There's a lot of stuff going in the right direction um i've always been more a little bit more positive positive than you but i think that in general there's a lot there's a lot structurally to the story but to your point it's especially the point you made at the beginning it's unfortunately not a two-year finan great financial story you know maybe not even a great three-year financial story but you can make the case that over the long haul they they can be a bit a major player again and again a dominant kind of dominant leading force back in in semis which, which would be which would be good yeah I, i'm not i'm not convinced that's going to happen yet but i do think uh, it's it's they're you know they're in it they're in the race they're not you know the, the, the potential for that to happen exists yeah and and i think what's what's interesting about this too is um you know where the structural changes to the data centers coming I'm not going to say this feels like, you know, a, a, a fresh opportunity for a company that's on the turnaround, but there is a lot ahead that somewhat greenfield, I guess. And so I feel like there's good timing here for, for what they're doing. I think still NVIDIA and AMD is very, very well positioned in this greenfield, new scale out of, of AI data centers and factories. But if they had a time to be just on the cusp of really being relevant again, this is a good time, if you see what I'm saying, like to greenfield opportunity, growth expansion ahead. If this was a couple years ago, they could have missed a pretty big window, not being structurally ready. But oh. there is some positive timing, which I think is interesting for the next five to seven year horizon for where they're at right now. Yeah, I think that's right. They're, they... It could it could have been much worse. It could have been much worse. They could have missed it entirely. Much worse. Now they at least have a much worse. They have a, 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 a they have a fighting chance here. I, I, I'll tell you one of the interesting things in my conversations with people, in a lot of the off off the off the record kind of comments is the extent to which the the, the team here is is perfectly willing to admit that nobody knows what's going to happen with AI, and I think that's that's really valid, mm -hmm. right? We don't know which way the AI models are going to go. I don't think anybody in the world does, right? And there are scenarios in which we all end up with like really small models and those can actually run on CPU and Intel is, is right. a hero or it can go the other direction. Right. The models just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, uh, and that's not so good for them. And they'll, they'll admit that like they, it's, it's the degree to which nobody really knows what's going to happen is, uh, is is worth remembering but yeah you know, you know it, it, they're at least they're in the mix yeah agreed all right good uh good summary of kind of the 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 updated semi-industry landscape um thanks for listening everybody be sure to uh tune in to next week's episode like subscribe all those things. Give us a good review on iTunes. Always helps. Share us on Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>